Okay, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. Can everyone hear me okay? All good, Melissa. Thank you. My name is Melissa DeMars, and I am a behavioral health consultant with Open MOC. Welcome to today's webinar on Kratom. Open and MOC are privileged to be hosting Dr. Sheba Sethi and Rob McMorrow. They will be presenting Kratom 101 with the goal of helping providers recognize the signs and symptoms of Kratom use and how best to address and adjust for its use. During our presentation today, audio and visual capabilities will be turned off for attendees to limit distractions. We do encourage you to ask questions of our presenters. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Click on Q&A, type your question and hit send. We'll address these questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. We are offering CME, Social Work CEU, and McBath credit for today's webinar. We'll have a slide up with information about obtaining these credits during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We will also email the continuing education credit information after the webinar today. You do have until February 2nd at 12 p.m. to obtain your credit. Briefly before we introduce our speakers, we are excited to share news of the recent integration of two organizations, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative MOC and the Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network OPEN are now combining to create a new OPEN. As one combined single organization, we are rebranding together as the Overdose Prevention Engagement Network. For those who may be familiar with only one or neither of our groups, we have each separately been successful in addressing opioid stewardship and substance use disorders across the state. Our missions have always been closely aligned, but our strategies to create impact have been distinct. The Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network initially focused on prevention, guiding providers in safe opioid prescribing to manage acute pain. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative initially focused on treatment for opioid use disorder and increasing access to this life-saving medication for opioid use disorder treatment. This strategic collaboration allows us to more broadly and efficiently address the full continuum of opioid and substance use disorders from prevention through to treatment. Together, we are the new OPEN, the Overdose Prevention Engagement Network. We're really looking forward to realizing the power of this diversified approach and united vision. We continue to offer consultation services. Our on-call service provides same-day consultation connecting physicians to experts who specialize in prescribing medications for opioid use disorder. They can answer both individual treatment and technical assistance questions. Our experts can now support physicians with a broader range of substance use disorders and clinical scenarios, from MOUD treatment initiation and maintenance to complex acute care and perioperative pain management in the setting of OUD, our on-call clinicians can help. We also offer expert-led education and training sessions like today's webinar. All of our webinars offer free CME, CEU, and MCBAP credits. And for prescribers, all our credits also qualify for the DEA-required SUD training. We continue to provide MOUD training for physicians, and this year we're incentivizing primary care providers, so PCPs, with $250 to complete one of our MOUD trainings. We're hoping this helps encourage confidence and willingness to help expand access to MOUD treatment. To prevent new persistent opioid use, OPEN established and continues to update evidence-based opioid prescribing and counseling recommendations. These recommendations are based on patient reported outcomes after various acute care episodes, and they provide data to inform opioid prescribing. You can access more information about all of these services more directly using the QR codes or visiting our website. The slides will also be shared as follow-up to the presentation. The new OPEN is now better resourced to support partnering communities and healthcare organizations we provide tangible tools to reduce harms of opioid and substance use, and our hope is to disseminate resources to places that need it most. We encourage you to partner with us and apply for our programs. We offer a free library of evidence-based printable educational materials for both providers and patients. 
Our patient educa education materials can be co-branded by us for free and are available in English, Spanish, and Arabic. Provider education supports best practice implementation for primary care, acute care, obstetrics, pediatrics, and dentistry. We provide safe medication storage and disposal options. We assist groups all across the state in hosting local medication take back events. We fund implementation of permanent medication disposal boxes for qualifying applicants. And we provide charcoal disposal bags and medication lock bottles for healthcare and community distribution. Our overdose rescue support consists of funding naloxone vending machine and distribution boxes. We have a wonderful naloxone administration training. These trainings are offered as live, virtual, or free online training courses. And last but not least, we understand that effectively addressing opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders requires deep collaboration and tailored solutions at the local level to meet the unique needs of each part of the state. We continue to provide regionally dedicated behavioral health consultants. Each BHC works directly with physicians, physician groups, and community organizations in your area to help build connections and, net and networks locally for you. If you're already connected with a BHC in your area, wonderful. If not, you will be receiving a follow-up email with each BHC's name and contact information. Okay, and with that, I am happy to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. McMorrow is board certified in emergency medicine and addiction medicine after completing a fellowship in 2018. He has worked with MOC since 2021. Dr. McMorrow is currently the Director of Addiction Medicine at MidMichigan Community Health Services. Dr. Shiva Sethi is certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. She has worked with the MOC since 2017. In addition to MOC, Dr. Sethi currently works as a medical director for several rural jails and lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, Dr. Sethi and Dr. McMorrow, thanks so much for being here today. I will turn it over to you and just let me know when to advance your slides. Thanks, Melissa. Um, happy to be here. Uh, really looking forward to this. Um, next slide, please. So um, we don't have anything to disclose. And just a caveat, we will be discussing off-label use of uh, buprenorphine in cases uh, to treat uh, kratom uh, use disorder, not an official diagnosis, but uh, one off from opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start a lot of uh, <clears throat> kind of lectures with a case. Uh, this was a specific case that I had um, in my clinic about three years ago. Um, I received a call from a uh, collaborating psychiatrist who was looking to get uh, a patient in who had co-occurring alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorder. Um, and they wanted to know, because they couldn't carry Vivitrol, if we can get him in today and give him a shot of Vivitrol. So then he showed up in the office and this is kind of a, a case that we'll go through throughout the lecture that kind of gives some uh, context to Kratom. So this is Dan, we'll call him. He's a 29 year old man referred to psychiatry for a Vivitrol injection. He had a past medical history of depression, anxiety, alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, in sustained remission from the psychiatrist and nicotine use disorder. His uh, alcohol history started um, when he was about 15 and progressed to early 20s. Uh, he was drinking up to a fifth a day and he stopped drinking completely in his mid 20s. He relapsed two years ago and received a DWI on the same day. So this is pretty typical uh, patients that we have. Next slide, please. Um, when he came in, um, I got a, a more detailed history of his opioid uh, use. Uh, he started uh, Norco pills at 14, progressed to IV heroin by your early 20s. Uh, again, this is pretty typical. Um, and then he told me something that he forgot or didn't really bring up because I asked him um, if he took any other supplements. And he said he's been, quote, stable on Kratom for two years with an occasional opioid use. Um, so, you know, he didn't let his psychiatrist know that. And, um, this was the first time I was hearing it. Um, he said his Kratom use has escalated and seems to wear off quicker over the past two years. He said he takes around 18 to 20 grams, uh, daily, which is about 18 to 10 pills. He was buying offline, uh, five to six times a day. And progressively over the past couple months, he had to take it more frequently. 
Uh, he can't go more than eight to 12 hours without Kratom use uh, due to feeling pretty bad. His last use of Kratom uh, before I saw him was about um, 7 p.m. the previous night, and I saw him about 9 a.m. Next slide, please. He was on clonazepam, uh, half a milligram PRN once daily, some uh, bupropion, uh, sertraline, hydroxyzine as needed. Um, and, he, and he read that he can get um, a XR naltrexone or Vivitrol uh, to, quote, get off both that his um, psychiatrist told him. Um, he told his psychiatrist he hasn't had any opioids in months and alcohol in five months. And he asked, can we get it today? So that's just some food for thought as we progress in the uh, lecture uh, on kind of what you guys are thinking and what approach we can take to this patient as we go through the process. Um, next slide, please. So just a little background on Kratom. Um, it's a uh, from the species uh, Mitrogena speciosa. Uh, it is a tropical evergreen tree native to Southeast Asia. Uh, most kratom in the U.S. does come from Indonesia. It is in the coffee family. We're seeing reports in the early 1800s, especially in Malaysia and Thailand. And then in the Western side uh, in the U.S., we see reports in the early 2000s of kratom kind of creeping up. Um, it has been used for centuries in traditional medicine in Southeast Asia, uh, mainly for pain and um I think increased work efficiency, they said in Thailand when I was doing some research. It is not regulated by the FDA or scheduled by the DEA. Um, next slide, please. So Kratom, it contains over 40 known psychoactive alkaloids, um, but only four are known to be pharmacologically active. Uh, the most prevalent is the mitragynine or ginine, um, some will say, and others is 7-hydroxomitragynine, uh, uh, which is the other one we'll kind of focus on. Um, next slide, please. So mitragynine, um, it is 2% uh, of kratom by mass, but up to 12 to 66% of total alkaloid content, depending on um, where you get it from um, and what country. Um, again, there's variations in different parts of the world. Uh, some literature says the Thai versus the Malaysian strains are different. They have a higher uh, component of the mitragynine um, in, uh, specific countries. Um, I've also read data that, um, you know, the Kratom that comes over here, you can get, um, legally, um, there is even a higher content of the mitragynine. They, um, they, they kind of, uh, super, superimpose it. So, um, it is a partial agonism of the mu opioid receptor. So it does have that effect on the opioid receptor. It has a less affinity for, um, opioid receptor than morphine, so it doesn't lock as hard uh, to that receptor. Uh, there is partial agonism or antagonism at the delta and kappa opioid receptors. And again, there's still a lot we don't know. This is mainly theorized in in vitro studies. They also noticed that it has a broad affinity for receptors, including serotonergic, adrenergic, and gaminergic, and even dopaminergic pathways. So we're seeing a ton of different um, um, pathways um, that are related um, to Kratom. So it's, it's really a mixed bag on how each individual reacts. And there is some theorized that it's a non-opioid receptive pain reliever um, relating to that COX-2 and prostaglandin um, expression as well. Next slide, please. So here are some of the kind of the superficial, you know, reasons why people do use Kratom and you'll talk to them. One, to treat pain, uh, brings them in to treat opioid withdrawal symptoms. Anxiety and depression, uh, people will tell me they want to limit their or, or discontinue their opioid use. They can't get into treatment. They heard about Kratom. Uh, boost concentration, there is some theorized evidence um, anecdotally that uh, in lower concentrations, it used as more of a stimulant. And to experience euphoria, a lot of synergistic effects with other um, drugs and, and substances that patients will feel, you know, in a combined effect that'll, that'll, uh, uh, you know, help that effect. So next slide. Um, overall prevalence. So there's not a lot of data on it. Most of this data comes from, you know, kind of self-reported uh, um, studies or uh, surveys. Um, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health in 2019, about you know, 0.7 to 1% of US adults tried Kratom in 2019. They did another one in 2020. 
Um, this was in an ASAM lecture I, I went to about a year ago that 6.1% of study respondents had tried Kratom in their lifetime. This was an online survey. Um, there is an American Kratom Association, <laughs> believe it or not, um, that estimates 15 million people use Kratom each year. Um, so that was interesting as well. Next slide, please. So who is uh, using Kratom? Um, so the data on Kratom consumption is, pr again, primary from self-report uh, surveys. Um, most commonly, we see it in people with an underlying history of opioid use disorder or substance use disorder. Um, it, it, there was a, a strong association between vape nicotine and cannabis use and Kratom use. So we see that kind of uh, poly substance use uh, kind of progress as well. Um, one study did find that Kratom was less likely among those prescribed buprenorphine in the past year. Uh, so there is some anecdotal evidence about uh, using buprenorphine as kind of a one-off with a co-occurring opioid use disorder. Um, so that's, that's good. Next slide, please. Um, and I think I'm going to take over for here, but I wanted to ask, Rob, do you find that most of your patients that use Kratom are on buprenorphine? Or do you think that, that that's like that um, previous slide, your patients are similar, polysubstance use? Um, I mean, obviously they have polysubstance use because they're coming to see you and you're an addiction doctor. But right. What is I would say most are polysubstance use. Um, the other ones were, you know, started Kratom to, quote, get off uh, their opioids and or a lot of them, you know, are close to a methadone clinic or, or, or a bupe treatment and uh, they really had no kind of choice and they heard through friends or it's easy to get, so. Have you seen a lot of patients on buprenorphine that also use Kratom? No. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen too many either. I did have one who would use the Kratom when her pain was unmanageable. Uh, she supplemented with some Kratom? Yeah. Yeah, I think I did have one too. That's interesting. Um, so uh, all of you submitted some really excellent questions. Thank you so much for that. And one question that we got was, is Kratom legal? And so I found this map and I couldn't find a date stamp on it to, to help us know how um, up to date it is. But from my you know spot checks, it does seem to be fairly accurate. And so on this map, green is uh, the green states all are all where Kratom is legal. And so you can see Kratom is legal in Michigan. The orange states have some local bans or regulations. The red states and the red dots are states and cities where Kratom is banned or illegal. And the blue states um, have adopted the Kratom Consumer Protection Act bill which was a federal bill introduced in the Senate in this past October, October 2023. And the bill is requiring that the FDA hold a hearing and establish a task force on the health and safety of products with Kratom. So I think that the bill is encouraging um, more regulation of Kratom. Next slide, please. And so in Michigan, um, Today, Kratom is legal, but the Michigan House passed a bill in May of 2022 authoring, authorizing regulations on the sale, production, and distribution of Kratom. And from my research, as far as I can tell, the bill is still being reviewed by the Senate. So that's also something to look out for. Um, Michigan might be um, you know, passing some laws that regulate the sale, production, and distribution of Kratom. But right now, as far as I know, there, there aren't any. Next slide. So where can you get Kratom? Um, I think that I put some pictures in here of places you can get it. You can get it actually in gas stations. And so the picture on the left is a gas, gas station advertising selling Kratom and CBD along with um, ice. Um, you can get it in smoke shops or cannabis shops. Um, you can get it in a place uh, called Kava Bars, which I wasn't too familiar with. And apparently these are um, popular all over the country. They're especially prevalent in Florida. But they're these, um, they're these sort of like bars where you can get, get this herb Kava, which is a Western herb 
promoting relaxation, and they often sell kratom as well. And kratom is, we'll get to this, but kratom is made into a tea, so they actually sell the kratom beverages. And you could also get it online, and there's quite a few places you can get it online. And the American Kratom Association has alone has 45 qualified vendors that they um, recommend on their website. And I don't, you know, I, ca I can't really verify this, but doing the research for this presentation, I read that it's a $1.5 billion, billion with a B dollar industry. Um, so again, I'm, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's quite an impressive number. Next slide. So how do you use Kratom? How is the product available? So most of my patients get it in this powder that you can see here on the slide. It's a green, it's a, it's a quite impressive green, impressively green powder. Um, and from the, you know, the places I listed on the previous slide, um, you can, you can use this powder to make a tea or make it into capsules that are also pictured here. Um, you know, I read online that you can smoke it, but I have not run into that. So I can't, I can't really say how that's done. Um, you know, patients have told me that they also just like measure out a bit of the powder and throw it into their mouth and, and sort of chase it. Um, it's, it's, it has a very, very bitter taste. Um, and the, the patients tell me that the tea is quote unquote disgusting. So I, I, I've never tried it, so I can't verify if I agree, but um, that is what they tell me. Um, many of my patients prefer to take it as a tea because they have told me that it hits them, the effects come on in a few minutes versus the capsules take longer. Um, when they do brew a tea, they need to dose more often versus the capsules, which seem to have a slower onset of effect, but, uh, but last longer. And again, I don't have a real official way to verify this, but this is what my patients are telling me. Um, you know, when I was researching for this presentation, I also found that it's now being made into a concentrated extract, which I think Rob and I spoke on Kratom maybe a couple of years ago, and I didn't find any research on that a few years ago. It might have still been present, but it doesn't seem like it was as prevalent. And so the concentrated extract is mostly sold in, in drinks or shots, but I did also find some gummies online, which I included a picture of here. And these gummies have, each have 30 milligrams of mitragynine. So um, I, I, these gummies look like candy to me, which is, which is also worrisome, but next slide. And this is a drink that actually Rob sent over when we were doing research that he found. Um, so this is just a random drink that we found that has mitragynine. And so you can see, I, I underlined the red underline is mine, but um, it this drink is promoted to help with relaxation, productivity, and fo focus. Um, and someone asked how much it costs. So it looks like this 12 pack of two ounce bottles is 24 servings and it costs for a one-time purchase $157. So um, I don't know, that's a good amount. And it also does have a um, ingredient label and it lists the dose of the mitragynine, which is 40 milligrams for one bottle or 20 milligrams for one ounce, half a bottle. Um, again, as Rob mentioned, you know, it's not all the products always have the milligrams, have the ingredient labels listed. So it's great that this one does, but due to the variability of the potency, just like with other drugs that we're seeing on the market, um, it's, it's difficult to compare across products what 20 milligrams really, really means. Next slide. So I included this here because um, I, in, I found that this Tamp the Tampa Bay Times, which is a newspaper out of Florida, did a really extensive report on Kratom and the Kratom industry um, recently. I think it was released late last year. Um, unfortunately, a lot of, we don't have a lot of, because Kratom isn't regulated, it isn't scheduled. We don't have a lot of um, published research or studies on Kratom. And so 
um, a lot of the data we have is, is a few years old as well. So this was actually more up to date and more um, recent than a lot of the other uh, information I was finding in the literature. So I thought I would present it to you. Um, so they built a database. They, um, they had four full-time staffers um, build a database of overdose deaths and interview people who worked in the Kratom industry, scientists, et cetera. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really excellent reporting, I think. There's three parts, and I, I recommend it to anyone who's um, interested in learning more about Kratom. Next slide. So this is a figure from that report from, by the Tampa Bay Times. And so they tested, um, I think, 20 different kratom powders to try and figure out how the levels of mitragynine can vary. And as you can see here in these 20 powders, the levels of mitragynine and the concentration of mitragynine varied considerably, as well as the levels of the other um, alkaloids. Uh, they also found that several of these products didn't have ingredients listed, didn't have dosing instructions, and didn't have information about their potency. And so this was independent testing that they did on their own. And it's probably something that your patients and clients will be running into. Next slide. And so they also looked into some of the concentrated extracts. And so as you can see, this MIT 45 Super K Extra Strong Extract is a small drink similar to the one I pictured earlier. And it, I looked it up, it has 1200 milligrams of mitragynine. And so as you can see, um, you know, one serving of that bottle, which is I think 200 milligrams of mitragynine is equal to, you know, or I'm sorry, one bottle of this drink is equal to three bottles of another drink or five bottles of another drink six pills or 31 grams. And so I think for patients that are not experienced with using Kratom, um, this, this could be dangerous given it's, um, given some of its properties. Next slide. Okay, so um, a few details on some of the pharmacodynamics of Kratom. I will say I had a tough time finding of, um, finding articles on this that were uh, that agreed. There's a there's some data out there. It 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 varies. So I found some studies that said uh, that they think kratom has a half life of three hours. Others were close to 24 hours. There were more studies that stated the uh, 20 23 and a half hours. So I think it's it's probably closer to that. But again, I think we need much more research on kratom before we can say for sure. We do know that we see patients um, similar to opioids exhibit tolerance and withdrawal. And so if they stop using Kratom, they will have signs and symptoms of withdrawal within 24 hours often. And Kratom is metabolized um, via the liver, hepatic metabolism, and it uses several cytokine P450 isoenzyme isoforms, which will be relevant later when we when we when we talk about medication interaction. Next slide. Thank you. So I found this really nice figure in a review article looking at the some of the neurologic um, adverse effects of kratom, and so this is the dose dependent effects and receptor targets of different doses of kratom. So at lower doses of kratom, um, kratom is said to act more like a stimulant. And this is via antagonism of the serotonin and alpha adrenergic receptors. At higher doses, it's said to act more like an opioid. And this is through agonism of the mu and um, the mu opo op opioid receptors. I would say more mu opioid receptors because those are where we see the clinical effects of, um, of opioids. So, and then this, this slide says at a, a doses greater than 15 grams, you can experience sedation. But I will say, I think that 
you know, given that patients develop tolerance to kratom quickly, your patient might experience different symptoms at different doses. Also, we know that, um, or we think that most patients that are using kratom, especially using kratom regularly, have a history of opioid and or some other substance use disorders. And so they might have a higher tolerance at baseline. And so I would take these numbers with a I would take these numbers as a suggestion, but talk to your patients about how much they're using or how much they think they're using. Um, and oftentimes they, you know, as we, as I'm sure all of you know, they don't really know. So, you know, how many capsules, how much tea, um, and you can go from there. Next slide. So what does Kratom withdrawal look like? Um, this sure. was... Oh, I'm sorry, Rob, is this your slide? Okay. Yeah, go for it. I don't, it's fine. So on paper, I think that it, these are all symptoms and signs that we expect to see when someone is in opioid withdrawal. Um, but anecdotally, I have had a few patients that have come in and their primary drug of choice was Kratom. And I found that their withdrawal um, was marked by much more sort of sympathetic overdrive symptoms like anxiety, irritability, restlessness, insomnia. And these symptoms were very prominent. They made daily functioning very difficult and they persisted for weeks to months. Rob, has that been your experience as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, typical opioid like um withdrawal symptomatology um and again this is anecdotally i probably had maybe 12 or 15 patients that you know if they stop for 6 12 18 hours um you know i do a cow score on them and it's pretty pretty similar to opioid uh, withdrawal great thank you And I think next slide, and I think this is, I think Rob is taking over now. Thank you. Thanks, Shiva. So um, I was just going through the chat. There's a lot of great comments and questions. Um, so we can give some guidance on, um, you know, transitioning to Butte. We'll do that at the end. Um, and there's some other the questions that can be answered with uh, the slides upcoming, but we'll kind of tackle these as we um, get to the end, if that's all right. Um, some interesting statements, too, about um, some presentations, um, which are interesting. Um, so people ask me about any ad, um, literature or uh, pregnancy related to Kratom outcomes. There was a uh, peer literature review. Uh, there was five published case reports uh, that met inclusion criteria. It was six mothers who used Kratom during pregnancy. Four out of the six used Kratom. Uh, three to four times per day, not 34, sorry, it's a typo, uh, for the entire pregnancy. Uh, but polysubstance was reported in four out of six. And there was, a, again, you know, that's pretty theme themed uh, polysubstance use with Kratom. Only two out of the six used Kratom. All deliveries were full term. Uh, five out of the six uh, infants uh, experienced uh, needle natal acid syndrome. And these included the two that were only exposed to Kratom. So uh, the theory is that, um, and what we're seeing anecdotally is, is Kratom use only uh, does give a risk factor for neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, the two mothers were treated with buprenorphine after weaning off Kratom during pregnancy. Uh, next slide, please. So toxicology, uh, there is no blood test really for mitragynine that I know of. Um, it is not detected by conventional drug screening tests. Um, it requires advanced tests like um, gas chromatography and mass spec that we send out uh, for a urine analysis. Um, we don't know the length of time uh, present in the urine. It is likely dose dependent. Uh, the theory it is lipophilic, meaning it's kind of stored in the fat tissue depending on metabolism, uh, other body factors, and it's individualized. So what I did is I pulled a, uh, a case report that I had um, and I kind of reviewed and, and went through a urinalysis uh, that I had a patient with. On the next slide, it's kind of interesting to give some context. 
Um, so if you can see, uh, this was back in 2022, um, in May 18th, uh, I had a patient present, um, I think this was a Dan, yep, because he had the clonopin hydroboxy. Um, so if you look and you see right down in that first kind of column there on 518, the mitragynine, uh, the kratom alkaloid, and the uh, 7 OH mitragynine, um, you can see that, you know, he was pretty high. It was actually greater than um, a lot of my patients. I'll see them, you know, a few times during the first week and then progress kind of weekly out. Um, and we get a urinalysis each time. So we stopped uh, at 7 p.m. the day before. Um, and then on 519 the next day, you can see that um, that alkaloid decrease in the urine. Two days later, it's still there. Um, seven days um, no, I'm sorry. Um, uh, nine days later, it's still there smaller. And then I even had, um, it looks like it was about two, two and a half weeks, uh, before he was completely negative. Um, so that's just kind of a case report anecdotally that I saw and that we trended. Uh, so again, you will see it long in the urine, uh, but it's not for, it's patient specific. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and then again, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, next slide. What are the most common as adverse effects? Um, again, agitation. Um, I think a review of poison control called agitation, about 20%, tachycardia, nausea. We'll see fatigue, drowsiness, vomiting, um, confusion, and seizures. I think uh, Sheba uh, said it's about 6 to 9% of uh, seizures you'll see as well um, posted on the uh, review of the poison control calls. Next slide, please. Um, cases in the literature, um, it affects a lot of organ systems. We see acute liver failure, hepatitis. There are some cases that um, kratom use up to 90 grams caused some uh, hepatitic, hepatitis and, and, and liver failure. Once this was removed, it resolved uh, acute kidney injury, uh, cardiotoxicity and arrhythmia. There is some in vitro studies that shows prolonged QT possibility with uh, elevated kratom exposure. Uh, again, neonatal abstinence syndrome and the seizure coma, I think 2% of the uh, uh, review of the poison control calls um, listed coma and respiratory depression as well. Next slide, please. Uh, again, seizures are common, about 6 to 9% in the U.S., so always tell your patients that there is some data uh, with patients uh, using Kratom, and we don't know what's in it. It's not regulated. Um, so up to 10% almost uh, people report seizures with Kratom use. Um, in Thailand, some articles report seizure rates up as high as 17%. Um, and again, there is a commonality with patients with a history of epilepsy. Next slide. Uh, medication interactions. It does work on the P450 isoforms, the CYP, including the uh, 2D6 and the P38, which is responsible for about 50% of medications. So there is a, a high potential for uh, synergistic effects on a lot of medications and a lot we don't know. Um, there is many websites that advise potentiating the Kratom experience with grapefruit juice. I haven't seen this with my patients. Um, I read in the chat that somebody said somebody was taking orange juice with it. That was interesting. Um, inducers of CYP3A4 include phenobarb, phenotoin, rifampin, St. John's wort, and some uh, steroids. Um, there was a case, I think, on the next slide that I read that we did some research on. Um, next slide. Can you go to the next slide, Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they had a case. It was kind of interesting. A patient was taking 150 milligrams of uh, venlaxifene or Effexor and 300 milligrams of uh, Seroquel. Now, the theory is that the Kratom actually inhibited the CYP2D6 and 3A4 receptor, thus potentiating the uh, Effexor and uh, Seroquel. Um, and this patient they, was on a lot of Kratom, 90 milligrams. Correct. They were on 90 uh, grams, I believe. 90. Yeah, no, you're right. 90 grams. Yep. And they presented with a QTC, I wrote it down, of 563 which milliseconds, which is very high. Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting. And then um, once they took that off, the QTC normalized. And um, and again, this is just kind of learning as we go with anecdotal reports and case reports. So uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so unfortunately, as I mentioned previously, we don't have that much data um, because Kratom isn't regulated. But this is, you know, this is the most recent data I could find in the literature and from the CDC. So according to a CDC report, um, more than 90 deaths in the U.S. have been caused by Kratom between Ju July 2016 and December 2017. And this is in 32 states and Washington, D.C., where they have a they have a database. And they identified only seven of those cases as Kratom only. Um, there was also a New England Journal of Medicine correspondence in 2019, where Colorado researchers retested postmortem toxicology samples from four Kratom-only deaths, and three of the four cases contained multiple drugs. And the fourth case was not tested due to an, an insufficient sample. And I, I think what the problem with, with the... Um, in many places is I'm not sure that metrogynine is regularly tested. I don't know, but I would imagine that that might be the case and lead to underreporting. Um, next slide. I also wanted to present the data from the Tampa Bay, uh, um, I think Tampa Bay Times uh, newspaper because I thought, again, it was well done. And so, if Florida required testing for mitragynine in 2020. Um, and, and so in this report, um, what the Tampa Bay did is, is starting from 2010, they requested all autopsy records from drug overdoses, and they excluded any that were ruled a suicide. They also excluded any cases that had issues with toxicology testing, and I'm not sure what they mean by issues. Um, and so this is the data that that they were left they were left with. Um, so they so the in this graph the the y axis is number of overdoses, which the top line is six hundred, and the x axis is the year. And so you know the the black triangle is kratom overdose deaths only through June twenty twenty two. And the area, the area that's green is all overdose deaths involving Kratom through June of 2022. And so you can see they found 46 only Kratom overdose deaths in this time frame that they were examining. And that's that's significantly higher than I think the two prior, you know, um, the CDC case report and the correspondence from the New England Journal of Medicine would suggest. Um, you know, I worry that with the rise of concentrated products um, and it being touted more as relaxation that, that people might not know what they're using. I think what's also interesting on this, on this graph is um, it seems like the Kratom overdoses really started to rise in 2016. And 2016 was also the year that the CDC um pain guidelines came out and I, you know i think unofficially that was that was the time when opioids really started to be deprescribed and so perhaps more people turned to kratom if they were opioids were decreased or opioids were um tapered off and again this is that's just my opinion i don't know if that's the case or not but it does seem like the graph certainly starts to um gets deeper at 2016. So next slide. Um, this is again from the Tampa Bay investigation, but they they did have this nice graphic on who was overdosing from Kratom in Florida. And so this is all Florida only data. I should have said that before, but um, it said that among all, all the Kratom overdose victims, so not just the patients for Kratom only, all, all of everyone represented on that previous um, slides graph. 94% were white, 79% were male, and 96% had a substance in their body that may be harmful when mixed with Kratom. And again, it wasn't clear, but I think they are referring to some sort of medication or supplement that might have a reaction with Kratom that had a drug interaction. 83% used an opioid that contributed to their overdose. And they also said that the majority of these patients um, had a history of drug use. 
Um, and, you know, I don't know how the demographics of Florida compare, compared to Michigan. I do know that Florida has about 20 million, a population of 20 million, and we have a population of 10 million. I don't, I don't know if I would imagine that Florida probably skews older, but I, I don't know if I could guess anything else. So I don't know if this, this data would really be applicable to Michigan, but again, um, there's not that much data out there. And so I wanted to share this with you. Next slide. So if someone is having a kratom overdose, can we use naloxone? And the short answer is probably yes. We have one case report showing successful resuscitation um, with naloxone. So I would recommend that you prescribe naloxone to any patient that tells you that they are using kratom. Next slide. Treatment. Okay, so there is no official kratom use disorder per ICD-10. Use this F19.99 code, other psychoactive substance use disorder. But I would say approach treatment as you would other substance use disorders, particularly probably opioid use disorder. Many patients that come to me that are using kratom tell me it's because they don't, and Rob already mentioned this, don't have access to methadone. They don't have access to buprenorphine. They don't have access to other treatment, and many of them are using Kratom for the same reasons that we prescribe buprenorphine, you know, trying to minimize symptoms of withdrawal, minimize craving, avoid fentanyl use. Um, and so we also got this really excellent question, is there any way of correlating the amount of Kratom with the buprenorphine dose? And just like other opioids, unfortunately, no. And so... I would say you should just treat the patient using Kratom similarly to um, a patient that comes in and is using opioids. Um, I, I will say many of my patients that have been using Kratom and using significant amounts of Kratom have had an opioid use disorder, and so that can also skew, um, skew the dose. Um, and again, I mentioned that the anxiety the symptoms of anxiety are really prominent. And so for patients that are using primarily Kratom and minimal amounts of other opioids, I have really had to treat them with clonidine, hydroxyzine, and then I found a case study mentioning labetalol, which I have not used. Um, I am partial to clonidine because we use that during my training, but if the patient has done well with hydroxyzine, I think that's valid as well. Um, I usually start this at the time of buprenorphine initiation, and I've had patients that have never been able to, to stop the clonidine, albeit at a lower dose. Um, and so I find that that's, those, those adjunctive meds are really helpful with the, um, the Kratom initiations. Next slide. And then, you know, I know Rob and I have mentioned how there's really a paucity of um, studies, and I found this in my research. So I think this is great, you know? Um, it does look like there's an open funding opportunity for looking more into the addictive um, aspects of Kratom. Next slide. Thanks, Eva. So just to follow up uh, on our initial patient, uh, when he did come in, we discussed treatment options, including uh, XR, naltrexone, uh, buprenorphine, methadone for OUD, acamprosate for AUD. So we decided to start on bup and acamprosate with this history of alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorder. So we initiated buprenorphine. Again, he was around 18 to 20 grams. Last use was about uh, 12 to 14 hours prior to coming in the office. Uh, so we decided, you know, it was kind of a, there's no real, um, you know, protocol out there. I know that was one of the questions. Um, so we waited about 24 hours. Uh, after 24 hours, he did have a cow score. I think it was between 12 and 14. Next slide, please. Um, and we ramped him up uh, over that last, uh, that first week uh, to 20 uh, milligrams of bu. Um, he said the next week after that, he felt, quote, normal for the first time in two years. Uh, he was ecstatic to be off the Kratom. Um, and he, now he's tapering off the, uh, the clonopin. And he feels actually the Kratom worsened his anxiety uh, due to uh, increasing uh, withdrawal symptoms so frequently. And again, this is what I see often uh, with my patients that tell me, you know, they have to ramp up, ramp up, ramp up frequency and um, uh, amount as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So a couple of takeaways, always ask about Kratom use. The last data uh, or lecture I went to at ASAM, uh, the survey showed about 40% of people that are using Kratom won't even tell their primary docs. Um, you know, they don't view it as a substance or any harm. Uh, so always ask about Kratom. We implemented, um, you know, that questionnaire in our office specifically for Kratom, even when we're screening now. Uh, they won't disclose it. They don't consider it a drug or any harm. Um, and always be careful to screen for Kratom use before giving uh, Bivitrol because that could potentiate a precipitated withdrawal um, in theory. Um, and again, wait seven days uh, if you're going to give the Bivitrol uh, that we decided. Uh, but again, he did well in the BUP and, and now he's doing tremendous. So that's just one case. Um, next slide. And now we'll go through questions. Thank you both so much. Um, really appreciate this information. It's fantastic. I am going to, um, before we start with questions, have this CME slide up. So if you want to click on the QR, QR code or uh, click on the links below the QR codes, you can um, obtain your credits. Again, this will also be emailed to you uh, after the webinar. I know we're nearing the end and we have a lot of questions. So Dr. McMorrow and Dr. Sethi have been looking at the questions and they are going to just go through and answer as many as they can. What we can't get to, we'll do our best to record and email um, any responses that we can. So turn mm -hmm. it over to you all. Great. I think the first one here is, I thought Kratom was going to be added to the schedules and be restricted federally. Is that still the case? I don't. Uh, from my research, it doesn't sound like that is um, going to happen anytime soon, but there was a question of, of that happening a few years ago. Um, is the use of Kratom higher in those who are trying to get off alcohol? I don't know the answer to that. Do you have any thoughts about that question, Rob? I have not um, kind of seen that uh, correlation, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen it more with patients that are using opioids. Um, so I don't know. Or trying to use it as an opioid substitute. Mm -hmm. um, is there an age limit when allowed to purchase? I believe there isn't in states where it's not regulated. Do you know, Rob? That sounds right, right? Yes, I believe. Not 100% sure. Um, what kind of doses have you seen in your patients who are taking Kratom? Wow. Um, I mean, I've seen, you know, probably the highest I've seen is, is, is I think, 30 grams. Um, I haven't seen the 90 like that one case report, but, um, you know, they've escalated and, and they never start with that small dose or that high of a dose. It always escalates over months and years. Um, one uh, patient told me they were spending, I think, you know, $1,200 a month on Kratom, so. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I had a patient who was on very high doses of Kratom once, but she had a history of heroin use. And so she just, she would, she would, she would brew a very strong tea every two hours. She wasn't sleeping at all, but. Um, I feel like the heroin use really was a, she used heroin for like 20 something years and she used Kratom to get off the heroin. So, um, or to discontinue her heroin use. So how does Kratom cause death? That's a great, that's a great question. And I don't know if we know the answer to that. It seems like, um, at least from this Florida newspaper report that the, the deaths didn't uniformly, um, look like what we would expect when people overdose on opioids. Some of them seemed more like a stimulant overdose. So I I don't know the answer to that question. I could, you know. Um, do you have any thoughts on that question, Rob? How Kratom causes death? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think maybe if it's so um you know, if there's so much mitragynine, it has potential to for respiratory uh, depression, mm -hmm. like any other opioid. But you know, national databases and everything, it's just it's hard to kind of tease out because of so much poly drug use with them. 
you know we've we've seen yeah. that freedom only deaths i think everything after was teased out i think there was a study out of colorado that said there was one potential kratom only death but they couldn't everything else had you know poly drugs um you know benzos and everything else in it but that one kratom death they didn't send it out for possible fentanyl analogs so they couldn't even attribute it to that um but so there's a lot we're learning anecdotally unfortunately we don't have you know can't say 100 percent on a lot of this stuff but you know we're learning so yeah i agree we have another question here about guidance or insight on considerations for treating kratom in ingestion intoxication or overdose in pre-hospital EMS settings. I don't know. I feel like it would, it would depend on the presentation, but if a patient is presenting as if they are in a, like a, similar to an opioid overdose, I think I would recommend trying several rounds of naloxone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last lecture I went to at ASAM, they said, you know, well, will it reverse kratom use and it's a definite maybe there's no really harm in it um so i would do it immediately um yeah. is it i think it was a in vitro study that you know it, it they looked at a pig ilium uh, that had opioid receptors and they and it did reverse it you know after they the kratom was um you know potentiated it so is kratom the same as gaba I believe the answer is no, but it does have effects on the GABAergic pathways. Um, Rob, have you seen or heard any youth using Kratom? I unfortunately don't see patients younger than 18, so I cannot answer that question. I have not. I don't either. Uh, okay. But yeah. I thought that was the case, but. I just want to say we are at one o'clock. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sethi and Dr. McMorrow. Again, uh, any questions still left in the Q&A, we will take a look at. And uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate having you here and we hope that the rest that you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thank you.